Good afternoon, everyone. I call this January 12th, 2023 Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Derrick, I understand we have a quorum? We do. Okay. In adoption of the uh, agenda, have you all had a chance to review the agenda items? Yes. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion to adopt the agenda. I make a motion we accept the agenda. Second? Second. Sure. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Agenda adopted. Has anyone, has everyone had a chance to review the last month's meeting? That's 8 December. Are there any omissions or corrections? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion to accept the minutes as written. Make a motion, we accept the minutes as written. Thank you. Second? Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Minutes approved. All right, I'd like to welcome our guest uh, for this meeting today, uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas Johnson and Ms. Rhonda Souls. All right, thank you for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hanson. Well, you won't get to hear a whole lot from me tonight, so I guess we'll just jump right in. And um, TJ is our utilities maintenance superintendent, so he's actually been with the city for 20... Uh, I'm on my 20th year. 20 years. Wow. So he, he started in utilities maintenance and has worked his way up and is actually um, responsible for the entire division. Um, he's been a great addition to our team. He's been in place for, he's going to have to help me, but a year now, 18 months? Yes, roughly for the uh, superintendent, superintendent position. So um, tonight he kind of wanted to talk to you about the grease program. We used to do a lot of... Um, Updates about about our grease program. We actually did it at every meeting and um, We moved to including it into your insert. So you had the um, The actual information in your Monthly report, but one of the things we wanted to share is with staff changes and shortages shortages that we experienced uh, over the last couple of years um, it really kind of changed how we handled inspections and there, you'll you'll look on there and you'll see a lot of zeros for inspections. We kind of want to take a minute and explain why. So TJ is going to kind of walk through that and show you um, why we haven't had to do as many inspections and then kind of walk through what a grease trap is and show you some examples. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks for having me this evening. Um, so, where these zeros exist, in the past we were doing routine checks on different grease traps throughout the city. At the time, we had more of a grease program because we had a dedicated grease inspector. Now those positions have kind of merged with other positions such as supervisor, backflow, so on. Um, so these inspections are not required, but we do have different things that will trigger and a need for an inspection. And I'll go over some of that in the slides here. Um, so in the future, we'll be doing things a little different, and I'll also get into that. If you have any questions, let me know. So the Grease Trap program, every food establishment must have a Grease Trap. Some of them have them internal. Some of them are external. Um, every food establishment must have their grease trap emptied every 30 days. If not, that is one of the things that will trigger an inspection from our division. So does the city empty grease traps or is it out like waste not, management outside? Not at all. Outside. So, okay. Exactly. So every establishment has their own <clears throat> company that they hire or they're on a contract Services. with. 
and they'll come in and clean out their grease trap. And this is supposed to be done every 30 days. Now we have some establishments that have more of a problem or have produce more grease. So we'll require them to do it a little more often. Um, but everybody is also required under 26-122 to, um, they have to send in their manifest by the 15th of each month. That is how we track and make sure mm -hmm. that everyone is actually following these guidelines. So um, when they turn in these manifests, we have a log, a system that we enter these into. And if they're not there, we get notifications. And um, so then we act accordingly, depending on who hasn't and will go out. And that's one of the things that I mentioned earlier. It will trigger the need for an inspection, an on-site inspection. Is it a tenant's responsibility or is it the building owner's responsibility? Like if it's a, like a building grease trap. It's the owner operator, okay. whoever is, whoever is operating, whoever has the license for that facility. So, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be per se the landlord, it, whoever is in responsible charge for the restaurant itself okay. needs to make sure that these things are getting turned in. Now it gets kind of questionable because a lot of times you'll have multiple managers and you'll have a general manager or a regional manager. And depending on who is in control, sometimes it gets hairy. So we see a lot of times where they all say, well, I thought this manager took care of it regardless. Um, that's not our problem, but we need to see these manifest and show calls that you have been cleaning your grease trap as required. Now, does this work with like the um, health department and everything at all, or is it totally separate? Did y'all work together on this part with the health department? Kind of have their, their requirements for grease and everything. Right. Yes, they do have their requirements. Ours are specifically oriented to 26-122. So it'll be a little different. Um, Your priority is keeping it out of our sewer system. That's exactly right. So, so, so we want to we want to keep it out of our sewer system because once it's introduced into the system, like you all saw in the demonstration we had over at the uh, plant, <clears throat> those things like grease and um, illicit discharge, whatever it may be, causes problems for our pumps, uh, wear rings. Uh, our trucks have to go out more often and clean the line segments underground to remove blockages. And especially, and the temperatures have a lot to play with it as well. Uh, when it gets cold, we have a lot of main breaks and you all know about that, I'm sure you've heard recently. But uh, also the grease coagulates faster and at a harder, it's, it's actually at a harder rate too. So we have bigger blockages, it costs us money. So we try to stay on top of this in order to prevent the grease from coming into our systems. Well, this, will the, this will shut a business down, correct? If, if they don't submit the if paperwork they don't on time? And so, so if they don't comply, the, first, the fines are very small to begin with. So the first fine will be a $25 fine. The second one is $50. And afterwards, it's on a case by case basis. We'll have a discussion. Usually it doesn't go that far because nobody wants to get a nasty gram or yeah. you know be labeled as that business. So it usually doesn't go that far. But if it were to go any further than that $50 um, fee, the fine, then we would have a discussion and have to come to common ground. We have had one, two, one, one business, two instances where they did not do this, caused a spill. We had to go clean it up because it ran out of the parking lot down a city street to a storm drain. So we went, cleaned it up. We built the business for city time and 
force and use of our equipment because they caused the problem, and then we find them. And the fine, the second time, I don't remember the first time, the second time the fine alone was $2,500. So, but they had, you know, the first one obviously wasn't that. Um, so we do have, and our, we can go up to $10,000. So, you know, we wouldn't go, unless it was on purpose and excessive, we wouldn't go there to begin with. You know, I want to say the first one was probably less than a thousand, and I want to say the second one happened within like two months or three months. I mean, it was, it was fast. So, and that was several years ago. You gotta have consequences. If not, then that's, that's right. Imagine. That's right. And Mr. Kellum, you asked earlier if we are responsible for actually cleaning them. Of course, you know, like I told you earlier, the answer is no. But if we were to go do an inspection or if we got a notification or a complaint by a surrounding uh, citizen, uh, another business owner, or even an employee at that establishment. If it's necessary, we have gone out and cleaned them to prevent a spill, spill. like he just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. And then we would, of course, back charge yeah. them for our yeah. equipment and manpower. Yeah. Yeah. And our fee schedule allows us to do that at, um, 10% above cost is what's in our fee schedule. Yeah. So here we have a diagram of a grease trap and I'll explain how it works. Of course, you have the restaurant on this side, then your influent pipe will come straight out of the restaurant and that T actually slows down the water from just rushing in and making it to any point in the system, in the uh, trap. So it'll come down, of course, the solids are always heavier. They're gonna go to the bottom. Um, the grease is gonna float to the top. That baffle wall also slows down the process and forms as a divider to keep some of the grease from going on the effluent side of the chamber of the trap. Um, so once it goes down and, a, and on the other side of that baffle, you can see where the grease is considerably thinner than what the grease is on the influent side. Um, then you have another T on the other side, on the outflow side that leads to our city sewer in that T at the very top of it, you should see water. That grease line that does go all the way across that trap should be broken up at those two T's. So when you look, and we also consider that a type of inspection sight glass, basically like a sight chamber. So when we pop that lid, that's above that, um, the gray block up there, those simulate lids. Yeah. So when we pop that lid and look down, <clears throat> usually you're gonna see grease. You can't quantify how much grease is under that top layer from looking at it. But if you were to look in that T and you see that it has taken on grease itself, you know that they are out of, out of the compliance. Out of storage, storage yeah, exactly. So now the grease has not only formed as a top layer, it has gone down, consumed most of the grease trap, and has made it back up the T. And uh, one of the telltale signs is we'll get a call, hey, we're having backups over here, or something isn't right with our grease trap. And we get there, the reason is because they have had an excessive amount of grease. And they may have been turning in their manifest on time. But like I said, some places have more issues than others. So, so those are the ones that we typically ask to bump up their uh, removals when we see those type things. So when these things are clean, are they only skimming the grease off the top? I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not sucking out all the water and everything in the entire trap, correct? Correct. It is, it's similar to a septic tank. Okay. So, um, what we do, it depends on how bad it is. 
if that grease cap has come down to where you see baffle wall right. written, you might as well go ahead and take, take this down on. to the to the bottom gotcha. of the tank. Okay. You know, um, but that's true. So if it is maintained, it is not necessary to do it every removal. Gotcha. But there comes a time where those solids will start trying to make their way yeah. to the top as well. Okay. And that will reduce your containment time yeah. with the flu with the uh, liquid. Gotcha. And what do you do with the grease once you clean it? Where, how does that get disposed? The, they, um, they have <clears throat> a, an area at the landfills where they have to pay extra charges to dispose of uh, different material. And at our place, if we were to clean something like that, we have a drying bed where we dump it in this, into this drying bed, let it dry out over time, then we'll take a tractor, put it in a dump truck, and take it to the same very place, um, to the landfill, but it's a separate, it's more or less a uh, hazardous waste area of the landfill, but the same, same, same idea. But we let ours dry out, one, for the weight, Two, because it's easier to handle right. once it has solidified. You know, when it's sloshing around, it's we hard. have issues yeah. with it coming out, and we don't want any citizens in front of their vehicles to be splashed or whatnot. Before you leave that, and one other thing to consider from the restaurant's point of view, it sounds real simple, right? Don't put your grease down, and this will take care of what little comes off dishes through the dishwasher and those kind of things but you got to imagine that the owner or the manager isn't typically the one handling the grease and things that are being removed so there's no guarantee that you know especially on some of those bad ones there's not you know some shortcuts taken where it's added to the system intentionally where they just dump it down yeah. the drain. i right. mean you're talking about a hourly you know sure. one of the lowest paid <coughs> sure. employees that's right <clears throat> on a dirty job and so there there's things like that that you see and some of them are more frequent yeah how big uh, are these things what's up general um, we large. have some that are a thousand fifteen hundred gallons it looks like a septic tank and they're underground now the in the in-store ones are much smaller they they go under a sink or or something like that there are a few hundred gallons at the most. The one that we put in over the outreach is probably 12 by six or eight by six or eight foot deep. It looks just I like a concrete subject. Yeah, I came and over during that process. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember that. Does and it, everything that comes out of the store go through there? I mean, so the, the, there is plumbing that okay. is separate. Some of it is separate, but that will be plumbed off of, let's say, a restroom or something like that that we know won't contain grease. Um, it but depends on the trash. So, so at, at, the, at the community outreach over there, all the restrooms come out and tie straight into the yeah, sanitary right. sewer. All yeah. the plumbing within the kitchen area sure. comes out and runs through that. So it's, it, it's basically two separate systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you, you ask about who's responsible. Some of that depends because there are places in town where a grease trap serves a shopping center that may have different yeah. entities in it. And, you know, if they're, if they're standing up a, a storefront and they don't know what's in there, a lot of times we go ahead and recommend put a grease trap in because you know, if you no. don't, you're going to limit yourself and you'll never have a restaurant. Yeah. And it'll cost more like on the back end to retrofit yeah. the establishment. That's, that's one of those that we do get complaints about during plan review. You know, we say, you know, some people look at that as we're requiring it. We're just, it's not a requirement. We're suggesting it because we've seen it happen. You end up with an empty storefront and some little restaurant wants to come in and now you're limited because of a grease yeah. trap. Yeah. So, Logan, did you have them at Reader Shack? Mm -hmm. oh, they were built yeah. in. Okay. So the one we had Internal. in Swansburg, well, two different ways. So the one in Jacksonville, they had them separate for the restaurants because um, they wanted restaurant space in the corners. And then in Swansburg, they had it like Wally said, 
they had a shell and they just wanted whoever, so they had it throughout the whole system. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on those two different setups. So, yeah. But they were the size of a parking space and that manhole covers the whole nine yards. Yeah. yeah. So a lot question, of one more question. So Other the question. The outflow part of this, is there any filter on that or is it just a straight flow? So if grease is there, it's going to go into sewer. It, it goes into our sewer system. Okay. Yeah. So this is the line of defense. Yep. That, that's the whole purpose of this uh, trap is to prevent these solids as well as grease from making it into our sewer system. So if it goes into a sewer system, do we have the right to go back and find them for that or charge them for cleaning that out or it, whatever? It gets it's, harder it's, once it's in the system. Yeah. Because how yeah. how do you say that's your grease, right? right? <laughs> so like so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, when, yeah, it, exactly. when it gets into the sewer system itself, our sewer mains run along many storefronts, yeah. many uh personal residence and so on and so forth. So like he was saying, it's hard to say where this where this clog was formed at um, or who caused it. Now we know where it is, so that can eliminate people downstream, yeah. but we don't know who upstream may have caused yeah. it. Because of course, once it comes out of the establishment, it's not solidifying immediately. It may travel <clears throat> and it may travel to, we have over 300 miles of sewer. So, wow. and you can imagine the distance that some of these things travel within our lift station basins, so. And sometimes what you'll see is there's a common spot. They, mm -hmm. utilities maintenance has hot spots that they go to every mm -hmm. week and it's because the, the grade's not quite what it should be in that location, or there's a belly, or so it's a, or multiple restaurants on the same line. So it gets harder because it'll, if it's, you know, if it's got good grade and the water's moving, it'll move a long ways. It takes something to settle it out or something to get stuck with caught it, to as, catch it. As well as if it's at the end of a run, and there is not enough establishment with um, that's producing sewage to push, push that down. So at the end of a lot of our runs, whether or not they're flushing or introducing um, illicit materials into our system, just because there is no flow behind it to move it, we have hot spots. Wow. So those are some areas that we hit weekly as well. And we call that our sewer route list. So say you like development wants to go to a certain area and they're at the end of a run, right? And they want to put like a big restaurant or something that might produce a lot of grease. Do you ever, not necessarily turn them down, but do you ever have to do anything different because of that? Because you know they might have, like say it's going to be like a big wing place or something of that nature. And where they want to build it, it might cause issues because how the sewer is laid out. Does that ever become an issue or no? It has not yet because typically... The establishments that come up, like food restaurants or whatnot, are already within a basin that we have running anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and we don't have very many dead ends within our lift station basins. Um, maybe that's something I could get into in another meeting. Mm -hmm. But, but the uh, the way the system is laid out is we'll have we have forty eight lift stations, and with each one of them, the area, everything in that area goes to this one lift station. So typically you may only have a few to as many as 10 or 15 dead ends, but you usually won't have a big establishment at the dead end. It just, and knock on wood, I guess it's just happened that way. But I'm sure that if it were to happen, the engineers would factor that in yeah. or have some kind of pumping system. And some of these places actually have pumps that assist the grease traps. So, good question. Uh, fast food, probably your worst ones, I guess. It's like your most grease. Yes, yeah. the fast food restaurants. Um, like wing the top worst <laughs> establishment, though, not for just grease, but for everything, is the... 
downtown. <laughs> yeah. Um, the jail. The, 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 the jail. The jail. <laughs> see, the jail, <laughs> and I'll touch on that. <laughs> but the jail at one time, and they still do it, but we had a bigger issue um, several years back with inmates crushing up different products. Uh, they were still, they're still famous for crushing up styrofoam cups. So if you go to our Pine Lodge lift station, you know where the old boat dock is? Now they put the ramp on the other side. Yeah, the, yeah. the old so, USS USS ramp. ramp. Yeah. Yes, so, mm -hmm. so right there, that uh, chained off area, that's our lift station for that area. And you would find anything from those crushed up uh, styrofoam cups to bags of chips, um, bed sheets, pillowcases, sometimes shoes, parts of flip flops, uh, all kind of, you would be amazed with the things that made it to our system. And ultimately it would cost us, the city, to repair the pumps, to remove these objects, to step up our cleaning of the lift station. So we required the jail, when they did that renovation, to install their own grinder, to eliminate some of these items well, before, the before they them. make it to us. And they still make it but it's a lot finer, it's a lot more manageable for our pumping system to handle. Yeah. But I saw a sheet come out. I just want to know how somebody mm -hmm. figured that out. Because yeah. my kids can stop up a toilet with toilet paper. Right. Yeah. <laughs> how in the world they get a sheet down there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking that there had to have been some access points within the jailhouse. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether they were like this or I don't know, and I'm really not interested in finding out <laughs> but i'll tell you uh we've seen some crazy stuff come into pine lodge lift station mm -hmm. i know that's not grease but it's still things that we have to clean up and deal with out of the system so this here is a picture of a what we consider a clean grease trap and i know it may not look clean to the average eye but this grease trap in this establishment is in compliance uh, you can see where the influent pipe is coming in. Then you have the baffle. On the other side is, is recessed, so you can't see where it's going out on this particular one. But if they were not in compliance and if this was a bad situation, you would see a cap, what we call grease caps. And um, some of them are so thick that you can walk on them, and that's what we have here. Wow. This here, if you were to take a, of course, a sharper object would go through it, but if you were to take something that was kind of flat, like let's say a hand tamp, you could not penetrate that grease. Of course, we wouldn't walk on it, but you could. Yeah. If you had enough goal, you could. <laughs> so, and then you see in that inspection, I that I was talking about, mm -hmm. the part of the tea, it has already formed grease inside of that. It is not as thick as the rest of that grease cap, but you can see that it's already forming a cap yeah. inside of that inspection tea. How bad does it clean that thing? So it's really, it's really not much harder to clean than anything else because of the efficiency of the modern equipment we have. Um, so it's not bad, it's not hard, but it's hard on the system. Gotcha. So that's the biggest part. So if we were to go out there with one of our jet trucks to remove this, it wouldn't take us any time. Um, but at this point, you've probably <coughs> been introducing grease into the sewer system. Exactly, right? exactly, because it has made its way to that T. Yeah. So it's coming into our system and somewhere down the line, is more than likely going to cause an issue. Yeah. And um, so this is one of the ones that we have to inspect, well, that we require to have removed more often than 30 days. And it all stemmed and it was triggered because of 
multiple occurrences like this. So moving forward, now that we have a full staff, you know, dealing with the pandemic and everything, we've had some issues with uh, staffing and not being able to get the correct members for the correct positions and so on and so forth. But now that we are at a level that we are able to sustain moving forward, we are going to put every establishment on a schedule in conjunction with requiring their manifest be turned in by the 15th of every month. So that way in an annual, annually, we will have hit every establishment in the city of Jacksonville. And um, with doing so, I expect it to get better as far as less clogs in those areas, <clears throat> um, less backups, of course. And it also helps with the prolong the life of the pipes because the more that we go in and clean one area back and forth, we're you know we're breaking down yeah. the VCP, the vetrified yeah. vetrified <clears throat> clay pipe. Um, your thin and out walls of the pipe, all kind of different things. So that's our plan moving forward, and I don't think it'll be an issue to stick to this. Now, since it is not a requirement, I think we're going to do some things different on the uh, inspection forms that come out in the future. It's a possibility that we may be eliminating one of these lines that uh, pertain to the inspections. Now, the ones that we inspect because we were triggered or the ones who have violated and we have to inspect, we will be adding that in to our notes is gotcha. how we'll move forward. So. Now, would that be like the establishments without grease traps that you might be eliminating or, and would you mind explaining that to the new members here, what establishments would not have grease traps? You got 11 of them. That don't have don't grease traps? why they don't have grease traps. Okay, the, the ones that don't have <clears throat> grease traps, they have to have been on a... Uh, there, so the ones that don't have grease traps are restaurants that existed before, before okay. this ordinance went into place. Um, and at one point, we've been in 11 for a long time. At one point, I think we were at 13. And the way our codes work is we really can't go in and say, you have to do this right now. We get it through a renovation or an upgrade or something like that. Um, so... I think we've been at 11 for a couple of years now, but I think at one point we were at, we were at 13 or... You're 15 or, time. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, I remember it being up there, and as they, as they renovate, that's how we get it. And then, yeah, I think one of the other things that TJ mentioned that I'll kind of go back and point out is, you know, the grease traps are being inspected and pumped monthly by a third party that then has to submit the paperwork to us, which we review and track. And when you see paperwork violations, um, it, you know, what you'll notice is those numbers stay relatively close together, but that doesn't mean it's always the same one. Um, and we do track dupli uh, ones that repeat. So if they don't do it this month, they're hit with a $25 fine. If they don't do it two months in a row, the next time they're hit with a $50 fine. So the fine doubles the next time. So, um, you know, to that point, when we were looking at staffing availability and, and what we're doing, what we were doing was really going out and quality controlling a third party right. that was responsible for doing it and having to submit something every month saying, yes, we did do it. Um, now, we still find problems, or you, you find the one that fills up faster periodically. Um, but, you know, I think what you can see is even though 
we don't really have any inspections going on. You'll also notice we don't have any pumping violations, which means that they're at least doing the pumping that they're supposed to be doing. So this is one of those areas that we felt like, you know, when, when you're trying to figure out how to prioritize your staff time because you're short on time, this felt like a low hanging fruit that we could say, hey, we're gonna push that off for a little while. And the good thing is, um, with everything that council's done recently, this is the first time TJ's been almost fully staffed in probably three years. So it's a, I think we're one position, right? We have right. one vacancy. Exactly. So we haven't, we haven't, at one point we're in double digits and you're talking 30 some people. So, I, I mean, it, it gets tough. And, and even being fully staffed now with, um, certain workloads it becomes an issue so that's why we're going to have to visit these things on a as we can basis yeah, you know right um but being on a schedule will help us to not miss any or you know we'll be able to visit every one of them manually and it would be good to put eyes on them at least sure. annually because yeah. you can you can tell if something's failing or, or pick things up. And, and a lot of times, you know, we have to realize that we're protecting our system, but, uh, you know, somebody that owns a restaurant, they're, the grease trap is something that they're not focused on. They're focused on serving food and making sure customers are taken care of and they have staffing. And, you know, this is one of those things it's, out of sight, out of, out of right. Exactly, because it's in a parking lot so under metal lids that they yep. can't lift. So we're helping them just as much as we're helping ourselves yep. because we can spot things that will cost them more down the run, right. down the line, if they don't take care of it when we spot it. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, you can't always rely on the company you have removing this grease because those companies they have a quota they have to meet. They are there to clean that grease and, you know, do their thing and get out of there. Exactly. So, um, sure. of course, they do some somewhat of an inspection or you have better programs at some establishments than others. And it reflects in the paperwork just like with anything else. So they're telling the customer that they're working for, yeah, we cleaned it. Then you go back in there and find out, no, you didn't. Then they hey, then you're, you're fired. Exactly. Get somebody else in there to do that job. Right. And if we have to, we could put somebody, I mean, we're the ones that say we're not going to accept from you because you've proven yourself Absolutely. unreliable. Yeah. Credibility goes out the window. Yes, yeah. Sir. So, and so in, in wrapping up, I did want to share one story related to this. Is um, Right before Christmas, I, it, it was probably... Thursday before we closed for Christmas, um, so that would have been the 22nd, I got a, a video emailed to me from a citizen that was out um, picking up food for, you know, Christmas, and um, it was a truck, a tractor trailer, with hoses going down into manholes in the parking lot of Food Lion, and you can see the guy out there holding the the hoses, and you know, the, the, the citizen was very concerned, shared it with us, and he was worried some, somebody was pumping something in into the into system. system. So we right. greatly appreciate it, but we did share with them that, you know, that was a company that we routinely see responsible for Food Lion's grease trap. So what they were doing was actually out there cleaning it, but I think normally they clean it kind of after hours or, or later, and the, the you know, holidays, they were there right. being the holidays. They were right in the middle of the day and it's yeah. literally right in front of the store. <laughs> so but you know, those are you know, our citizens can look for those things. Sure. Those are things that are there for the benefit of our system. Yeah, good for that. Yes. Yeah. Any questions on grease traps or inspections? Thank you. 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 Excuse me. It's a very educational. I actually did. I mean, that's pretty good.
And you owned one for a while. Yeah, yeah I dealt with it for sure. But it's nice to know a little bit extra stuff about it. So, so that backs up what he said. They're worried about other things. That's right. That's right. That's right. I was trying to think, I said, did we get that done? <laughs> Somebody wants to turn it in. Somebody was doing it. And that's what I was touching on earlier. You know, you have multiple chiefs and sometimes yeah. things get overlooked because you expected the next person in line to have taken care of it. And it's just an honest mistake a lot of times. Oh, yeah. Obviously, that wasn't on your checklist. It wasn't on my company. <laughs> so, but the, well, other companies, I guess, just people should know that. I mean, there is actual poor sites on the station. I guess I'm sure, not sure what you call, it, but where people when they dump their grease from the fryers and stuff, like people, yeah. so people are aware of that. Right. Not everybody knows that, but I mean, that's where it doesn't get poured down the drain and things. That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah, you know? you're relying on the employee to get it there, yeah. but the right thing. they do have a. Most of the time, you see them in the dumpster corrals or something yeah. where they can do that. And all those services, they don't charge the restaurants to pick up because I guess they recycle it. Yeah. And then try and do it that way. I was going to mention, too, a lot of times our pump station are also grease traps, right? Yeah, they are. Yes. That's a great they, point. They, they become so weekly. We have, just like I was mentioning about our sewer routes, where we'll go around and service different segments and manholes the troubled areas. We also have several lift stations that are on a weekly schedule to remove the same types of grease caps off of the top of the wet wells. Wow. And I think it's quarterly, quarterly at our larger stations, our triplex and quadruplex stations, we have a company who will come in and remove all of the grease out of the large wet wells because it solidifies. And some of these rooms are maybe three or four times the size of these two rooms put together. Wow. Something. Oh, That's how big it is. And they are also baffled and chambered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. So we have to put the stations on bypass and they go mm -hmm. down in there and actually and clean, and, and clean them. Scrape it off the it's, it's a nasty process, yeah. wow. but it's a very necessary process. Mm -hmm. But you're right. This it does. We don't trap everything at these grease traps. Well, so much is residential. Yeah. 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 Exactly. exactly. Henderson's one of the worst. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I want to say at one point that one was when we went in to remove the grease. It had been a while. It was like six feet <clears> thick. <throat> yes. We actually went down yeah. and saw it when it was like that. Right. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> previous previous to that Eye opening. Yeah. We weren't we weren't cleaning it because it was thought that there was no methods to to, to to take care of it. And then we came across some company that said, "Oh, I'm willing to take that on. Let me at least try." Mm -hmm. And they knocked our socks off and actually knocked the grease off as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank Thank you. you. Okay. Yep. Uh, Tonight I'm going to do the CIP update. I know it says Christy up here. She's not here, so it'll be just me. So I apologize for the information I do not know. <laughs> That's why Wally's sitting over there. <laughs> I'm going to start with the water projects. Um, this first one, the FY21 water line, it's actually the water service line replacement. Um, this project is focusing on aging water lines around the city. Uh, we identify those that need to be repaired. We go in there and make those repairs, whether they're, you know, um, replace, rehab, whatever it may be, and then reestablish or establish new services in those lines we've made repairs. Uh, currently, we have the completed design and permits for Richards Drive, and we're looking at bidding that out by the end of the month. And one, one quick... Um, <coughs> Caveat to Richards Drive. Richards Drive is in the New River area, for those that aren't familiar with it. It's actually the road that runs beside Onslow Community Ministries. So if you're facing Onslow Community Ministries, it's the road to the right. And the city does not currently have a water line down that road, and we have fire protection issues along that road. So while it's not technically replacing a deteriorated line, that one we're doing because it is improving service, city service in an aging area. 
So that one's a, it's not quite a replacement. It is a new line, but it's because the city doesn't have proper fire protection service in that area. And with the addition of Onzo Community Ministries, um, their fire hydrant is actually on the, and fire department connection is on the left side of the building. And there's nothing on the right side of the building. And there's actually a small church that ended up catching on fire and we struggled to get it put out. We had to run long hose over to it. In fact, I don't think the fire hydrant is within like 400 feet of it or something. So this got <clears throat> Richard Drive is to actually solve that problem. Uh, the next one is the Black Creek well replacement. This project originally was going to be rehabbing wells one through five. Uh, after an assessment was done, we were told that wells two through five were not viable to rehab. So we were told to, or it was recommended that we rehabilitate well one and then turn two and two through four into a new Black Creek well. And then I think originally we talked about well five being up turning into a monitoring well, but that's something that would be down the road. But for right now, well one rehab, that design is at 90% completion, so. We're actually maybe slightly more than that. We've done, um, for, for a well that's been offline as long as well one has, um, you actually have to do all new well sampling as if it's a new well, and we're going through that process. That process just takes time. Um, so that's where we're at in with well one. And um, the recommendation from two through for two through five, I know we've kind of talked to this board multiple times about that. Um, but the idea there is to instead of rehabbing a well and spending hundreds of thousand of dollars on something that you're not going to get the life expectancy or the water capacity out of it that you're expecting, um, it's recommended that we just abandon them and find one new good production well that will likely replace the quantity or volume that we would, we would see from all of those. And if you remember, this one comes from, this project comes because um, we had a chlorine station that sat right on the side of 258 and a truck drove through it and took it out. Um, so we had to go back and reevaluate whether we spend the money to, it started, we were just gonna spend the money to rebuild a chlorine station or put chlorine at the wells and the company, the engineering company said, you might want to take a look at those wells because they're so old. They're from the sixties. Really? You might want to look at those wells because they're so old to see if you want to invest that kind of money before you, but when you do that. So, and, and part of that stems from the capacity use act that went in effect in 2000, 2001, where the city lost, 75% of our permitted capacity from the Black Creek. So do we really want to go in and invest all that money in something we can only pull 25% capacity compared to what we used to be able to pull, pull back in 2002? So that's where we're going with well one now and then possibly one other well in the future. And then from there, we'll decide whether we need to do anything else out in that area. Okay, the next project, Branchwood Water Service. Um, this came about after we received significant calls over about a period of about 12 months um, about water service leaks out there. Uh, this is an older area, so the, the lines are in pretty bad shape. So we're right now we're evaluating it and trying to figure out like the best route to go. Our but, history shows that the mains are in pretty decent shape. We don't have a lot of water main breaks. It's mostly the services in this area. So I think these were built kind of in the 80s, if I remember right. And it was the material that they used for the services is becoming brittle and that's where we have our problems. And so this would be the service from the main to, to the, the meter. meter. That's all you're responsible for. That's correct. So right now the way, um, the way the city and most water, um, <clears throat> most water authorities across the country operate, the 
the port, the main is the cities or the water providers, and the service that connects the main to the meter is the water providers. After the meter, it is the homeowners. Um, there's some legislation coming out that's going to challenge that. Really? Yes, and it come, it stems from the lead and copper rules. And those lead and copper rules, because of what's happened in other um, municipalities and, and for other water providers, Flint, Michigan's one, um, Jackson is one. I mean, those have been frequent in the news yeah. recently. Um, some of the lead and copper rules coming out are that what they're saying is by 2024, we have to have um, the, the city will have to have evaluated all of the services from the main to the house and determine whether lead or copper exists. So, um, and it's an unfunded mandate. So it's something that we're going to have to figure out. We've already started having internal meetings on how are we gonna do this? You know, there there is some good news, you know, there, Laws changed in 85 that said you can no longer use. So anything built after 85, we can eliminate. So, you know, we can we can assume that those materials are acceptable. But there's a lot of the city and I think about other municipalities across the oh, yeah. state and the country that are, are going to have to deal with this. that are way older than we are. What's so the problem with copper? Um, it just falls under the same leaches into the water. Just falls under the same rules. You know, there's a there's a, um, a quantity associated with it, a value. So you have to test for it. As well as yeah, if there's lead it. upstream of it, it the, the, the copper it, uh, yep. it absorbs the lead, yep. even if it's from another area. And once it has, has absorbed it it transmits to the home. So that's where the copper wow. comes into play. Or yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's gonna be challenging. I and there's, expect that. I mean, is there equipment that can tell well, you what it is? They are, one of the webinars I sat in on, actually, um, there's equipment that they're trying to, they've tested and they're, I think they're trying to prove accuracy where you go in, you take the meter out, and you you go you feed in a test and you go both directions. Um, others are doing a dig, visually inspecting. The problem is you don't want to dig from the from the meter all the way to a house. So there's there's discussion on what do you go three feet outside the meter or do you go ten feet outside the meter and at that spot that you located. Are you do will they accept that that complies for the whole hundred feet between the meter and the house, or the whole twenty five feet, depending on where the house is located? It'll be it's going to be interesting for us as well as all of the other utility providers um, across the country because that's not just North Carolina; it's an EPA requirement. So you'll you will have more discussion on that being the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee. In the future, when we actually have an idea of where we're at, it yeah. Uh, and this came out it, literally about a year ago. I mean, we didn't, we had no clue it was coming until it came. It, it was here, so we were hearing about it. Yeah. So we didn't know exactly what would be required. Yeah. We just heard mention of it. Yeah. So, and so and it's a short time frame. This the child. I mean, you know, we're. We're about 18 months away from the deadline. And I think I received, well, I think you were on the same email, but I received the spreadsheet and form that we have to use this month, well, <clears throat> in December. So we've had the information for about two weeks. It's going to be tight. And not only inventory, we have to notify the, each homeowner or whoever stays in that establishment about what we found in their yard wow so what are they saying if you find it then the homeowners got to replace it they haven't said anything about replace yet but if you read where it's headed it sounds like it's going to be on the water provider 
to replace it. Mm. Which still goes back to the homeowners who right. are paying for it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's going to come from rates. Yeah, right. absolutely. But they deem us more responsible since we're in the industry right. than right. to put it on the homeowner and hope and expect that they did it right. or had somebody do it the correct way. So they know that if we were on it and we're required by law to make sure that these yeah. stipulations are met, that's why I think it's going to be our responsibility. Better chance of it being right at the end. Exactly. Of the but the, the challenge comes to some of the older homes that have like lead and goosenecks that are actually in the home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have no right to work. I mean, I would argue we have no right to work in somebody's front yard, yeah. but at least we're chasing a, a water service right. at that point. But I mean, if you're talking about getting up and under or in a home, that's really going to be a challenge. Yeah. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> okay, the next one is our Bryn Mawr water tank upgrades. This is going to focus on improvements to put it back in service because currently it's not functional. Uh, the common tanks is what overrides Bryn Mawr. It's, um, the tank is... is too, the commons tank is so high and so large, it pushes water right out the top of it. So you, you put water in it, you can't get it out. So it's been evaluated and the booster pump station is currently in design now. And to add, just I, because this board may remember, the evaluation, evaluation included really two, three options. One, do nothing, just leave it as it sits. Um, the second is to um, raise it, and the third was to put a booster station. And even considering ongoing maintenance costs, the booster station is the cheapest option. So. That's that's the direction we're headed. In that picture, there are a lot of cellular antennas on that tank as well. Yes, you just can't see them. Yeah, because the angle. Mm -hmm. So, so right now it does have function, it provides cell phone service. So, <laughs> yeah. and it covers its own cost plus some. Yeah. So, um, it does have value even if we just let it sit. But the challenge, the real challenge, comes from operation of the system. If, you know, if we have an issue at the commons tank, then this tank, it, not having this tank in service would really cause a problem. And the, you know, I can, I can see how somebody sitting at home will say, well, if you're saying that commons tank would overpower and you take the commons tank offline, well then it should feed the system. The problem is the water will have been sitting in it for so long, we can't use it. So by the time we get it cleaned, put back in service, it down it's too late. Yeah. So that's why this tank needs to be put back in service. Okay, our Gum Branch Central Chlorine Project, this is focusing on safety improvements, uh, given that the surrounding area continues to grow and all that. Um, However, right now we've kind of shift priorities to LTS, which is something I'll go into here shortly. And it's the, the go back. But what I will say is um, there is nothing requiring this at Gum Branch Central because we only keep a limited amount of chlorine gas. But it, given the development of the area, we still believe that this is worth doing for the safety of that area. The bypass line cartridge filters. This, it, we're gonna install two uh, cartridge filters in our bypass line because currently there's no filter in there and so it's allowing um, solids to get through into our degasifier and the mixing tank. So in, installing these two filters will alleviate the majority of those solids getting in there. And it's really a lot of sand, I think, is yeah, what we what see over there. So what we see is sand and sorry, this is actually, these are Christie's projects and I've been involved in a lot of those. So this one kind of helping out, but um, if you'll remember, I know this, you've done tours of the plant. We bypass about 10 to 15% of the water around the treatment process. And the reason we do that is to add taste and um, you know, minerals back into the water. 
um, so still high quality drinking water. The challenge is, our, you know, we, we pull our water from wells and wells can pull sand out of the ground. They're packed with gravel. So sometimes you're getting the sand from that gravel pack. Sometimes you're getting it from the surrounding aquifer. Well, the cartridge filters are catching that sand before it goes through the filtration process. The problem is anything that bypasses. So if you say that on average, we're bypassing 10%. We have to assume that 10% of the sand or whatever we pull is also going by because that water does not go through um, the cartridge filter. So, and we actually have a project coming up. Um, this is not a CIP project, but it's a um, maintenance item for our 2 million gallon ground storage tank at the water treatment plant. And, um, Looking in, they can say, they say you can actually visibly see some of the sand in that ground storage tank where it's it's coming through, and that's where it's coming from. Is that that blended that bypass line that blends at the end of the process? So, what we're hoping is by installing those canisters. Really, that's that's the purpose is to catch that sand so it doesn't cause us problems in our mixing tank and our our two million gallon storage tank and the design is complete i know that it was put on hold and i think it was because the cost estimate came in so high so it was recommended that we hold off for right now um, yeah. i think we're trying to wait to see if some of the costs come down so. this is and the reason for that is this is the 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 majority of this cost is purchase i mean they've, they've got to install it don't get me wrong but the canisters are pre-made. If you remember, they're those big silver barrels yeah. that are custom built. And the cost of steel, the cost of manufacturing, the availability of materials. The engineers say, you know, like everybody else in this country, we're hoping things are starting to turn around. Yeah. We think you would be better off to wait because you're going to pay a fortune for what you're trying to get. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, we have our sewer projects. This is the Ellis Pump Station. This picture here is from um, Florence. I can't remember if it was during or right after. Right after. But um, this is going to include the electrical and bio filters, but it, currently, any time we get a lot of rain, it floods there. So this is, I think we're trying to raise the electricals. Um, so, and actually construction just started two days ago. Yep. So, If you go by there, if you'll remember, um, as you're coming down Ellis, the pump station is on the right, right at Artisan Hills. There used to be a bunch of woods right in front of the pump station. If you look, those woods are gone now. Um, we've cleared that. And what will be put, that's city property, what will be put there is an elevated platform that will hold a generator, a bypass pump, and the biofilter because all three of those flooded during Hurricane Florence and were taken out. And then at the station itself, the door you see and the vent that's actually in water, you can see it's kind of a little rectangle to the right of the door. That's a about a two foot vent um, for the station. That'll be relocated and moved up and the door will be a um, like a ship style waterproof door. Um, and all of the external equipment and everything will be up on that race platform that's above um, even the flood elevations that we saw during Hurricane Florence. And that way it's safer for TJ's people when, we, when we're forecasted to have a major event like that, they can actually just go into the station, switch it over to bypass, turn the bypass on, and it'll, the, the flow will actually just bypass the station and a pump will run it. And then immediately upon water's receding, we can go in, inspect everything, and then take the pump off bypass. We've lost a few uh, large pump <coughs> generators as well due to flooding. Yes. But at the times we had no choice because we had to have that station operating and functioning. Yep. And it was bad even in other rain events other than Florence. It always um, floods. It, it, that, that's it a bad area, yeah. you know. Then I think everyone, we've had this on here. Yes, <laughs> this has been on there a while. Yes. Uh, 
And a matter of fact, when you were talking about kind of debris getting into it, that I know that that's one of the reasons why this came about is it accumulates a lot of debris. Um, but the, the owner conducted an INI study and it's been quite a while. They, they completed what was called. Um, and at this point, I mean, it's in design, but I don't know where it's at. So there. we have um, the engineers evaluated the, the pump station. The pump station sits right at the bottom of the hill. Um, it, you know, if you go into Holiday City, it's on a hill and it kind of goes down and drops off. The pump station sits at the bottom left corner. Um, everything in Holiday City goes to the pump station, but a large area outside of the Holiday City also goes to the pump station. So there's some do or quadplexes and apartment, you know, multifamily buildings on the left hand side of Corbin going toward the park from 24 mm -hmm. all the way down to 24. And then it actually wraps around the East Drive, which is up behind um, the businesses that front Lejeune Boulevard. So all of that goes into Holiday City. The challenge we have is we have a little postage stamp lot. It's really not a postage stamp. It's more like a triangle. And getting, keeping the existing station in operation constructing a new station and um, being able to work or construct it is kind of the challenge for this project. We don't have enough property. So there's, we, we've looked at several different options. One is acquire right of way, which is something we can do. We just don't enjoy doing. Um, it's, it's expensive typically to go out, go in and negotiate. Um, Secondly, we've looked at possibly moving it over. The city owns the land um, to the right, or well, facing Holiday City to the left is the park. Um, we've actually looked and we think we could gravity feed um, from where the existing station sits across the power line easement over to um, the park area and go from there. But the challenge is we would have to bring the force main back to tie it into the existing location. Um, and then they're, I'm the last holdout, I think, but they've still got to convince me. I'm not convinced we can't do it. I know it'll be a challenge, but I'm not convinced we can't do it in the same location without doing that. Um, we may have to have some temporary construction easements, but I'm not convinced that it's not possible and which would, if that's the case, would still be the cheapest option. So it's, while it's, while the engineer has it, we have a PO for the engineer and the design engineer is looking at it. We still haven't narrowed down which option we're going to choose because that obviously has a budget impact and an operation and maintenance impact in the future. As well as trying to save some uh, infrastructure that we have over there. So, so let me ask you a question. I'm just reading some of those. So was Holiday City at some point it was... A private system it still is it is okay it still is a private system yeah so if you think about if you're familiar with holiday city um as you go in the pool is right there right the road to the the farthest to the right is daisy mm -hmm. the city owns the sewer that goes down daisy and then the back street is that's is it grace i don't know what so the if you go down the hill to the very end yeah. The street that runs nine, parallel to Corbin, along the whole back, the city sewer runs along that street. And the pump station sits right in the corner. Okay. The city owns that L. The Holiday City owns everything else that serves the mobile homes. And just historically, any mobile home park, not, not picking on Holiday City, any mobile home park where you've had mobile homes pull in, pull out, yeah. adjust, different sizes you go from a double wide to two single wides mm -hmm. they you know it's their system so they do kind of can do their own taps right. and move things yeah. around or tie multiple units into the same clean out yeah. i mean you see some over the years you see some crazy sure. things and as you can imagine some of those clean outs get lost and buried and not closed up properly Probably. um so they 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 the the previous owner 
worked very well with the city, went in and did an engineering report where they did some evaluations. We assisted um, with some information and they spent quite a bit. I don't remember the total dollar amount, but they spent quite a bit of money trying to clean up some of their I and I. Um, with any system, they didn't get all of it, but they at least they at least made good faith efforts to do that. But the one of the other challenges with Holiday City is it's a shallow wet well that has um, suction lift pumps that sits right beside a creek. Yeah. So we literally have about 20 minutes to respond before we start to spill. And if we spill, it's automatically reportable because yeah. it's going to make it to the yeah. creek. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of the worst of all scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've talked about is, uh, you know, if we can keep it on the same lot, the wet well either needs to be wider or deeper to allow for more volume so that we have greater response time. And then we'll go away from suction lift pumps and we'll go to submersible. That's and I think this is the one. only one. This is our last suction lift station yeah. in the city. <laughs> yep. So we'll, we'll be more standardized at that point. We won't, you know, it'll give us a little bit greater response time and flexibility. You move it over to the park, you might have a little bit more response time too. You might. <laughs> when did they change ownership? We've been talking about this place for 10 years. Yeah, they, uh, they've changed three or four times uh, in that same time period. Yes. Okay. I don't, I can, I'll can. i be honest, I don't know who owns it now. But when the I&I &I study was done, the owner um, was very good to work with. Um, and they had an on-site manager that was very good. Um, that would coordinate with us. I remember you talking about all that years ago. But yes. We still talk I about think it's changed spot. twice since then. <clears throat> yeah. And the property manager now is very cooperative, cooperative as well. So they help out with some of the things that we need. Uh, Shoreline Drive Loop Station. This is located right next to the New River uh, Basin. It it floods during high sir or it is covered by high surge. Um, so we're looking at raising the electricals, but uh, I don't think it, they've decided yet. No, we've looked, looked at a couple, a couple of, options. Yeah, we've looked at a couple of different options. The, the pipe you see is a vent. The, the wet well is actually just out of the picture. Um, and really all you see from ground level is two hatches. But what we've talked about is trying to take that equipment and relocate it either into a cabinet and pull mount it so it's up and elevated and then you know basically have the station itself sealed so that if it floods it doesn't the water you know we keep the water out because i can tell you we pump the new river when it floods here mm -hmm. um, is that down to Kerr street it's no it's on shoreline, shoreline drive shoreline. and it 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 is literally three feet off the road this is the last station when we have bad rain events or floods. This is the last station to go back to normal out of all 48. Yeah. Because we're pumping the river. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're literally pumping the river yeah. from this location. Yeah. We don't have to worry about every, anything getting out because it's all coming in. Yeah. So, um, but there, you know, there we've looked at, there's some, you know, the cell phone industry. I don't know if you've noticed around town, they're putting pole mounted antennas and they're kind of changing, you know, they're going away from the big tall antennas and they've got them now. So they're designed for a power pole or something. And if you look on the power pole, it kind of looks like a, a small refrigerator type box. Mm -hmm. We're looking at something like that, that we can, you know, move back, get away from the right of way a little bit, or, or at least the street within the right of way a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then have, you know, at most maybe a little platform that our worker can get up and get yeah. to it. Um, but, you know, this and the other is image. I mean, you've got two and three story houses right yeah. next to this that are waterfront. Right. Yeah. And we've got this sitting right beside. I mean, literally, you see the, the wall yeah. and it's right beside the driveway. Yeah. So this is something that, um, you know, it's it's not a easy solution, but we're trying to figure out what we can do. And of course, there are <laughs> <laughs> uh, This has been around for a little bit. 
Uh, I think it's also been referred to as Parkwood Regional, but honestly, the both four swing segments, they're ready to be put out for bid. Everything's done. Same with the pump station and LTS upgrades, that's ready to go out for bid. We have had it at NCDEQ to review because we have several grants through them. They've had it since May, all the bidding documents. So I was really hoping I was going to get to drive them. I had, they're asking for us to resubmit everything again um, to include some of the minor changes they had us do. Uh, I was hoping to have that there that week before Christmas. That was my plan was to drive them there, but we they told us they wanted us to have one of our, our permits that had been modified. They told us they recommended us wait until that comes in before we resubmit. And at this point, I don't want to give them any reason to hold off any longer. So I'm hoping the last thing that we have at this point is the engineer to seal the top page, the cover page of each one of these. So literally once we get the get it approved and they tell us, okay, we'll be bidding out segment two first, and then segment one will follow 45 days after that, and then the pump station and LTS upgrades will follow, I think it's about 60 days after that. Um, and between those three projects, they'll take about three years. So. Oh, and by the way, the permit we're waiting on is another division of NCDEQ. Yes. Good luck. So we need a permit from them to we'll give them our submittal. <laughs> and to read, I mean, their submittal process is, it's ridiculous. I'm, I'm sure you've never heard that before. <coughs> um, LTS piping improvements. This is when, <clears throat> I don't know if they were upgrades that were made, but the, the pipes were like, on top, you know, so they're exposed to all the elements and everything. So this project will allow us to bury it because right now when there's any sort of um, pressurized event going on, like when it's turning on, sometimes they'll move and there's, uh, I'm trying to think, lateral yeah. and um, I can't remember the other one. The happened. saddle is what separates. So, the connection point that you see right there periodically because you can see the sprinklers anchored yeah and the pipe moves so it just shears them apart i got you so it, you know it's kind of like turning on a water hose you know it even if even if you're standing on it it jumps a little yeah. bit right. it's exactly what happens and imagine some of its 12 inch pipe above wow. ground wow. and it will move and it's got concrete anchors that go across it mm -hmm. but and then on top of that with logging and mowing operations and everything else, just makes sense to try to get, it doesn't have to be deep, but just getting it below ground would be beneficial. And we hope to use, we, we hope to be able to use staff to do a lot of that so that maybe we can extend the dollars that we have available. You know, we can certainly do some of the smaller, the smaller piping like you see here. Or even have it like as a welcome on board Everyone gets to go out there with a shovel and dig. Just a cost Working, savings right? idea. <laughs> team, team building. This is the one I was talking about earlier. So the LTS facility upgrades. Uh, we were told that this was unserviceable. So um, we actually mm -hmm. already have it being manufactured. And yeah. I, I don't know if it's going to be delivered in March or if the other portion is going to start I know the construction, Nick and Nick was working on this. I'm not yeah, really sure. Yeah, Nick and I have been working very closely on this. The, the building you see on your right is our chlorine gas storage building. We can hold 25,000 pounds of chlorine gas. Anybody that is familiar with chlorine gas knows that that is a, it's a lot of gas and it's very dangerous. Um, it is a completely sealed building in case there's a leak. The good thing is um, if we were to have a leak at most, we would probably lose about 2,000 pounds because we, we do have, um, we have one ton cylinders in there, but we also have 150 pound cylinders. So the likelihood of all of it getting out at the same time is very low, but being permitted for that, we have to be able to handle all of it if something were to happen. So the little unit you see to the left in white is what we're talking about. 
And basically what happens, you can see there's ductwork that runs straight into the building. If there's a gas leak, that unit kicks on automatically. It pulls the chlorine gas into the unit and scrubs it off um, and then just exhausts the air. It actually runs it through um, caustic or kind of an acid material, acid chemical. And um, it, it scrubs off the chlorine and then just it's just air that comes out the, the stack. The problem is this unit was put in place in the 90, late 90s when um, LTS came online and we have a contract to service it. And at the last service, they basically said, we refuse to certify it. It's too old. It needs, you know, you. It, it's just, it's past its serviceable life. It is time to replace it. It would have been nice if they'd have told us that the year prior so that we could have planned. But um, so during this fiscal year, I actually went to council and asked for a, basically an emergency transfer. We pulled it from the other LTS project you just heard about, and we moved $700,000 into this project from that other project. So it didn't, it wasn't any more against our rate or anything like that. It just means we'll be able to bury less pipe when we start moving forward with the other project. But this is critical because, um, you know, we can't be in a situation, the city can't be in a situation where we aren't appropriately appear, prepared for a, a chlorine leak. Have you um, ever had a leak out there that had to work? Yes, it, it happens periodically. Typically what it, it, it's in switching over or, you know, it's, you know, we have to manually disconnect and connect the tanks and they have brass washers and those wear out and typically those fail. Every once in a while you'll get delivered a tank where um, it's just not quite, you know, they inspect them, but after it's delivered, a you'll have a like a, a stack failure or something like that. So um, typically we handle those in-house. We have maintenance staff that is prepared for this. Um, it's part of their job. They inspect it multiple times a day. Um, so we do have leaks that happen, but we have a chlorine meter in the building. We have a camera facing it. We have the scrubber system, so there's never any danger. Um, in the time I've been here, we had one situation where, um, I don't remember if the scrubber didn't kick home right away or something happened, um, and we had a, um, a chlorine gas leak where we couldn't go into the building. So we called, our fire department's a hazmat fire department, we called them, they came out with the SCBA gear and they went in and turned off the valve and took care of it for us. And then the scrubber system worked and, and pulled it out. Yeah, it actually was a broken pipe on the scrubber system and we repaired it while they were getting it shut off. That's the, that's the worst incident that I know of, but I can tell you this is something that we are very careful about because of that. I'm sure the SCADA system Lurks yes, absolutely. It's and it's right. monitored 24 hours yeah. a day. Um, <clears throat> but the other is it only operates when we're irrigating. So it's not like it operates all the time. So this, this facility only operates when we are irrigating in the field. It's really not part of the treatment process. The chlorine gas is there so that we can have operators in the field while we're irrigating because technically we're not supposed to have, it's there for disinfection. So we shouldn't have operators in the field if we're not running the chlorine gas. So theoretically we could irrigate with a short period of time without it. We just couldn't put eyes in the field to watch what we're doing. Uh, the FY22 inflow, or INF, uh, that's our um, ongoing program. So the first thing we do is identify areas in the city where we have, uh, you know, whether it's uh, offset joints, we're actually working on, a, I've been working with TJ this week, <laughs> getting all kinds of information, but we identify areas where we need uh, repairs done, whether that's, uh, again, remove and replace, uh, rehabilitate or cured in place piping. Um, we also do manhole repairs or rehabilitation through this. And right now we are 
the engineer has it. We've given him areas that we've identified and he's given us a proposal on what he think to design it and to have it repaired. And it's actually quite a bit of work that we sent to him. One of those is Brookview Drive. Yes. If you remember, we replaced a portion of Brookview Drive. This is lining the rest of it so we don't have to replace it in the future. Uh, Mill Avenue sewer replacement. This is about 292 linear feet of so it's eight inch and actually I originally that it was all clay it's not there's one small piece when I was watching the video this morning um, that is PVC but it is significantly offset um, it to where the camera couldn't even get passed through like I think it was at 78 linear feet that's as far as it got wow. so I'm hoping to have this out to bid by the end of the month Um, our water and sewer projects. This is FY23 infrastructure rehab. Uh, the streets we've identified for this one is DeWitt Street and North Bayshore. North Bayshore is uh, across the way. It's two segments, and that's going to be a remove and replace. Uh, DeWitt, because I was hoping to have this out for bid, but DeWitt it was a lot more. We've identified a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, there's, a, I think, about 40% of DeWitt that will have to be excavated. Yes, removed and replaced. We, uh, it's pretty bad. The other, it won't be the full 60%, but the the majority of the upper portion will be lined. We're able to line that. There's <clears> just <throat> cracks and things like that that we can do, but the lower portion, it is, um, it's really bad. It'll and take. most likely we won't have enough money for that project the way it sits because it's it's in, we estimated based on what we saw in, in a you know a cursory initial review when we were planning and either it's gotten worse or there's just things that we didn't see the first time because it is not good. Yeah. I also think around because of all the work that's gone around around it because we've done several streets around it all oh, that's kind of like a dominoes effect so i don't know if that's but it it's, it's gonna have to be realigned even um and this is just how our cip timeline goes so currently we're working on the first draft that will bring to finance and all that um but will this is just the cip update once we have that first draft uh We'll present that to you in in February. That's what we're hoping. March <laughs> probably February, more realistic. Right. March uh, may be more realistic, but we're aiming to have you at least a draft review for um, of the CIP, and that would be not the projects you've talked about tonight, but it would be those planning projects that we have in the out here. So. Most of those you'll have seen. I don't think we've added a lot of new projects this year. Um, most of those you've seen and, and some of those based on development and other things like we talk about every year, we may even be able to slip some of those projects out a little bit. So, and then Wally goes over the rate model evaluations. Um, and I think at that point is when before we bring it to city council, you guys approve the water and sewer and all that. Water, Wally brings that to you as well. <laughs> um, you know she's uh, pushing that off. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I think that for the most part, that's it. And just to kind of point out, you know, we kind of put some of those timelines in there, but you know, develop draft CIP, as you can imagine, we can't do that in a month. So. We've been working on that since November of 22. So we're, we're doing our best to get everything pulled together, get it ready, and then get it to you for review. So, and then the rate model evaluation, um, I think last year we actually got to you in April um, with that consideration. Um, so, because it, it takes us a solid month of working internal to run the model multiple times, move things around, and then run the model again. Um, actually, we end up running the model probably a dozen or more times trying to make sure that we've got everything aligned correctly and 
Um, and we're looking at or, or spreading and making sure that our rates carry us as far as possible. And Any questions on those? No. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we apologize, Christy couldn't be here. She had an emergency. So um, we'll give her a hard time and she can be here next time to present. To you. <laughs> Brandon did a good job. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, do you have another brief? Or I, I have a couple of things I'd just like to go over in an open discussion. <clears throat> I'm not sure he knows this is coming, but um, our, <laughs> our Christmas holiday weekend, um, which was uh, kind of from December 22nd through the 27th, if you remember, we had very cold weather. Some of us may experience some rolling blackouts um, and different things. Well, our crews experienced some unexpected rolling blackouts also and ended up having to ferry around um, generators to different stations to get them pumped down unexpectedly. So during this period, we ended up with 68 completed work orders from TJ staff wow. who were supposed to be yeah. spending time yeah. with yeah. their families. <laughs> Christmas morning, TJ was at a water main rig. Wow. So mm. just to give you an idea, with 15 of his other coworkers. Oh, my gosh. And a couple of more water main breaks the, the next the day. The next day. Yep. Wow. So we ended up with, I think, four total. Yes. Four total during that time period. For water main breaks, um, 20 stations that lost power because of the rolling power outages. So we had to do what he said, was hauling generators from station to station <clears throat> to prevent an SSO, as well as the smaller normal calls that came in yeah. in between those. <laughs> so. Um, our Plus crews, our crews worked every day of the holiday break, pretty much, I would say, at least six hours a day during these holiday breaks and did it without any hostility. I mean, they did a good Seven job. They, they, they yeah. really, they, we'll they really them. did. Yeah. But I thought that was worth mentioning because, you know, you can see them kind of spread around. So. Each of those dots represent one of those 68 work orders. Yeah. And you can see the, the, the gray dot that's kind of right there near the river. There's multiple there. That's where they were at the, at the shop trying to get everything closed out and finished out. But just a lot of credit to 16 people that worked. And then he mentioned earlier, um, well, I think we all talked about uh, the temperature having an effect. Yeah. Somebody brought that up earlier. Um, so a lot of these water main breaks were due to the cold weather that we had during the Christmas holidays. You all remember it got crazy cold that weekend. And um, so when the ground freezes and then thaws a little bit, freezes and thaws, it works a number on our pipes and we have beam and shear breakage. And some of these leaks, I think the one on Preston was the most severe leak because we had to trace and chase this leak for quite some distance because you don't know where it's leaking. So we were digging, 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 had to even go into a citizen's uh, driveway and take part of their driveway out to get to the leak. But um, it was all done with professionalism. The crew really stepped up. Yeah. It was it was pleasing to the eye, you know. <laughs> was it reasonably shallow or? Um, not really. Uh, it was normal, <clears throat> normal, depth. normal depth for our water main. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's somewhere so, between three and five. Yeah, right. Yeah. But the problem was chasing it down yeah. because the water shows itself here, mm -hmm. but the leak, the break was actually over on that wall, you know, so it, it yeah. leads yeah. path of resistance, yeah. you know, sure. um, but it was done, it was done professionally and safely 
and freezing. <laughs> yeah, it was cold yeah. and freezing. Last thing any of them wanted to be doing, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and another note on that, and I'll just touch on this and I'll leave it alone, but the uh, we were able to fix the majority of these water main breaks under some pressure. So because we took into consideration the citizens were doing what we wanted to be doing, right. yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. uh, preparing, yeah. preparing, yeah. preparing breakfast yeah. or, you know, the, the Christmas activities. Yeah. So we didn't want them to be without water. So we actually fixed it. The crews actually fixed these breaks under pressure wow. so that the citizens had water. Cool. They had it got so Mary Choice, man. Good it, Lord. They, they How did they survive it? They did. They did, but uh, it meant more to provide excellent service. Good job. Yeah. Wow. That is awesome. No, we're done. We're done. No, that sounds phenomenal. Thank you. We appreciate that. Please relay it to your, we'll to your people yeah, that we'll do. So we as a committee really appreciate what they've got we'll to do. do. Um, carrying on with the open discussion, do we have any other questions as a committee uh, to the briefers or Wally or the staff? Uh, I don't have. Go ahead. Oh, no. I just know all the presentations are I have a, a, a suggestion. It's probably not going to make Wally and his presenters very happy. Uh, but I would like to suggest, because it's hard in a row for people, especially the highway, to see the presenters, that they sit at the end when they're presenting. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. Makes it easier to see if it, them. If that works better for you, we can do that. I'm just saying, because I know I'm trying to lean back so they have a chance to <laughs> right. see. Uh, the presenters, I'm just, I'm just suggesting that you don't have to do it. It's, it's a suggestion on my part that we can see them better and tell when they're lying. The only reason I didn't is I feel like I'm blocking the screen for you. So. Yeah. Well, you're not blocking the screen. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just a suggestion. Okay. There you go. No, uh, everything sounded great. I appreciate the, the time and effort put into the briefs, as, as always. Uh, in closing, uh, our next scheduled meeting is uh, 5.30 on Thursday, February 9th. Uh, there should be a problem. Uh, okay, if there are no other issues, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Third. All right, we're adjourned. <laughs> Very good. Good job, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Great work, yeah.